My name is Jackson Dahl. I'm here with Matthew Nadeshot Haig, and we are on the Self Made Podcast. I think this is my first time introducing it, and it feels really good. <laughs> what is going on right now? <laughs> Wait, is that going to be the actual intro? I think if we should we go want for it. To it. Be. I want you guys to understand something. Jackson is a ball of energy right now, and I just know he's going to be rattling off the best questions. He's going to carry a great conversation. Let's go. You are hitting your stride on the Self Made Podcast, and Episode I could four. not here we be are. more proud of you. Well, it might be part of who's here with us today. I'm very well, excited for this. I absolutely love that, and I love the individual that's sitting next to us here. But first off, I want to welcome you guys back to the Self Made Podcast. You guys have made this a, a gleaming success for all of us here at 100 Thieves and for myself, so I really appreciate you guys tuning in once again. Again, as you guys know, this podcast is available in all places where podcasts can be found, more specifically Google Podcasts, Spotify, iTunes, and then obviously you can watch this video live on YouTube on the Nate Shot YouTube channel. You so, should probably watch it on YouTube and then listen on audio so you get just like double take, get all the information, and we get double the viewership. And watch all the ads and just participate. Yep, watch the ads as many times. <laughs> we gotta keep we gotta keep the lights on. Do here. it for Rocket Mortgage. Well, actually, we don't need to worry as much about ad revenue after today's announcement. Uh, depending on when you guys are watching this, today we announced that Hundred Thieves has raised thirty five million dollars in our Series B funding. That's that's incorrect. We are still very much focused on generating revenue. Okay, perfect. And this Wait is your the turn, best guests. time. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, we didn't bring the guest in yet. This is a perfect opportunity to segue into the introduction of our wonderful guest today. We have John well, we Robinson. we got to do the call to action. We I'm going to get the call okay, to okay, action. Okay, 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 okay. Wow, J Jackson, I'm I just like trying this. To, I'm, I'm trying to be by the book. Okay, well, listen, you guys can find this on iTunes, on, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, and we're going to read a five-star review here from uh, the the iTunes. We really appreciate Little it. Anytime you guys... Air. We're gonna, we're gonna, I love you. I love, I love you, Jackson. We're going to do, do our absolute best not to cut each other off today. I'm definitely going to try my best not to cut people off because I know I do that a lot. But please, please, Jackson, for the sake of the intro, sorry, I thought you were no cutting off. Out. So we have the five-star iTunes review from Lil Pro Air. He said, about to go to college for business and creating my own brand. And I've been looking up to Matt for that. And I'm really happy and motivated with this podcast. Thank you. This is the exact reason why we started the Self-Made Podcast. You're going into college. You might be graduating, whatever the case may be. But this demographic that has been watching my YouTube channel, you guys are all in a position now where you might be more interested in business and entrepreneurship. And that's why we love the Self-Made Podcast. So thank you for that five-star review. Make sure you guys try it out yourself. Now to our guest, John Robinson, the president and COO of 100 Thieves, a self-made man who has found much success in his business career in many different verticals that he has entered into. And now you run the show here at 100 Thieves. Thanks for having me, guys. It's a pleasure to be on the show. I think I've spent more time with the two of you than anybody but my wife in the last two years. So this, is, uh, should this, be. Should, be, this should be a good time. <laughs> As it should be. Now, Jackson and John... And myself, we all met in 2017 in Q4, around November, December. It was around that time. Well, we met a little prior to that, but... I actually met Jackson first. It's true. You guys have been I friends think, uh, longer mid than... mid-2017, and little did we know we'd be here. We connected for a coffee. We did. That seems like a very much a John and Jackson activity. Well, I guess it's like a normal We're in San Francisco. Too. We really have come a long way, I think. You guys have. So honestly, I'm going to let you guys just take it away. So I, I think the best course of action right now is I, I do want to talk a little bit about your background because we have done it in videos prior, um, especially on this YouTube channel while we were still launching the 100 Thieves YouTube channel. But I think it'd be really helpful if you can expand on all those things that you said, because I know you don't like to talk about yourself in a lot of ways, but I think it, it really could be helpful so that people understand who's at the helm at 100 Thieves and your business background and the acumen that you do have. Sure. Sounds good. We'd love to. Where do, you, where do you want to start? What do you want to go back to? Well, I think we start with, uh, let's start with college. Cool. Um, well, let's see. Uh, Talking to the mic. Originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. A Western guy. Um, I, uh, my older sister was going to Princeton. So that was really, really interesting for me. So I went and visited her. Had a great time. Uh, while, I was in, while I was in high school, I played a lot of lacrosse. That was like a really big thing for me. Uh, so as I was thinking about going to Princeton, I thought I was going to have to give that up. But, you know, Princeton was obviously the best school that I got into. So said yes. Um, and uh, was fortunate enough to make the team as a walk on there as well. So yeah, spent four years both working on school, was an economics major, um, but also got a, had a chance to, uh, to play while I was there as well. And while you were playing lacrosse for Princeton, I believe you accomplished something pretty decent. Uh, well, I, I, I was uh, on the sideline of some very, very talented teams. Uh, I think we won, the, we won the national championship my freshman year. And then we made the final four uh, my sophomore year and my senior year. 
So you're a you're an NCAA Division One national champion. <laughs> what? Correct, <laughs> dude. I would be talking about that so much more than you do, regardless if you played in the games or not. I guess that's one detail that you you never really talk about. But it I was love uh, that. it was a great group of guys. I'm still really really close with them. I was just back for my 15th reunion. Um, yeah, some very very spent an incredible amount of time with those guys. Like worked very very hard for four years, and so we had a lot of success. And eventually, even got to play a little bit my senior year. So. It all, were, all worked out. One thing that I find terrifying about college nowadays is that when I was graduating high school, everybody put so much pressure on students to make a decision about what they were going to do with their career um, in a very short amount of time. It's basically, okay, you, you get your diploma and then you have three months till you're a freshman in college and you have to figure out what you're going to do for the rest of your life. What for you now, whether that's true or not, because I, I know a lot of people disagree with that mindset. But what for you was interesting about economics and, 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 and drove you to make that decision? I actually I chose economics because it, uh, it was the most applicable thing. I knew that I wanted to get into business. Um, but I think the smartest thing that I did in college was just do a lot of different internships. And I think we've had a variety of people have talked about how important that is. And I did it both in college and then when I went back to business school, it was just like trying out as many things as I could. And a lot of that just went back to like sending cold emails and literally cold letters this is like, kind of before email and cold calling people just for opportunities. Like my first job ever was working for the Cincinnati Reds and I love baseball and I was really into statistics. And so I just like found a way to get in touch with some of the people at the Reds and like offered to work for free doing statistical analysis for them. And that gave me like a really good opportunity to say like, okay, I've got some like real skills here in analytics and statistics and economics. Like how can I apply those to something in the real world? And so getting to work for the Reds for a summer, like, it like allowed me to explore my passion for sports, but also understand what like a professional sports business looked like. Now, do you think those internships changed your mind in any of the things that you were doing in college or, 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 or it made you more inclined to go back to business school? Because so you talk about Princeton, but when you say business school, can you explain that to me and for everyone that might not understand what that actually means? Sure. So the, I guess I'll, I'll update you through when I went back to business school, um, Graduated from college shortly after that, uh, Electronic Arts EA in San Francisco got in touch with me and they said they were looking for somebody to be part of their acquisitions and investment team. So I moved to San Francisco, loved video games and was in finance at the time. And so my job was basically to fly around the world and meet with new game developers and see what they were working on. And when their games really took off, EA would often acquire those companies. Is so, that your first job in gaming? Uh, it was, yeah. And so I previously, I worked very, very briefly in, in venture capital right out of, right out of business school, or sorry, right out of undergrad uh, before joining EA. Um, but yeah, at EA, we got to meet with studios like BioWare and Dice and a lot of small mobile game companies as mobile games were just growing and bring them into the fold at, at, at EA. Um, but after four years there, I spent three years in San Francisco, I spent one year in China. Um, I knew that I wanted to look and see like what, what else was out there and business school seemed like a great opportunity for me to kind of like take a step back from the gaming industry and really look at, at what else was out there because it gives you basically a two year break to further your study in business, learn about a lot of new topics. Um, cause yeah, my background was in finance and gaming at the time. And I was like, I want to learn more about tech more broadly. I want to learn about marketing. I want to learn about managing people. Um, and business school actually let, let me do all those things. And you went to Wharton. Now, Jackson, is, is Wharton a, a prestigious business school? Wharton is about as good as it gets. Really? Yeah. Okay. And you went to USC. I did. Do you have any plans? Wharton, do, I, you have, do you have any plans to go to uh, business school? Uh, John and Jason once told me that if I left 100 Thieves for Business School, they would be very upset with me. They didn't use exactly those words. Um, and I, I think that was had a little bit more to do with the fact that we are building something really great here. Um, but I think it's also just really about timing. And I, I would ask, actually fire that back at John a little bit. Um, but my mindset has always been maybe someday, but I'm enjoying what I'm doing now and I'm learning a lot. And the point of going to business school anyway is to learn. So you want to learn more broadly about other business related mindsets or approaches or strategy, whatever the case would be. I, I think it's funny that we just skipped over the fact that you lived in China for a year, because for me, sitting back and thinking about where I might've been. How old were you when you did that? Um, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, I was 28 at the time. If I was 28 and even had like a, a thread of a thought, I'm going to go live in China for a year, that would be the most terrifying experience of my life. Can you explain why you went to China or what were you doing there? 
So I'd actually already gotten into business school and I was planning on going back and EA was like, hey, why don't you like, we really want you to stick around. Um, would you, would you stay for one more year and work for us before you, you would like, would you postpone business school? And I said, yeah, that sounds great. I'd, I'd be happy to. I love EA. I love the people that I worked with. I was like, but I want to do something more interesting. I want to do something a little bit different. And they were like, well, you can either go to London or you can go to China, which what's, what's more appealing to you. And I remember discussing this with my roommates at the time in San Francisco and one of my good friends from college looked at me and he's like, come on, let's be, let's be serious, John. Are you, are you really going to move to China? And it kind of hit me like, this is like a, this is a huge moment in my life. Like, am I going to be the guy that just like continues to have like a nice, comfortable life in San Francisco? Or am I going to take advantage of like this crazy new opportunity that presented itself and move around the world with zero friends and zero language experience and just see what happens? Dude, that is fucking Awesome. I, it's, it's, it is mind blowing to me that I've known you now for almost two years. And I, we've talked about that experience before, but very surface level. And that mindset is like, I admire that so much just because I don't think I'd ever have the courage or the desire to do something like that. And I always hear a lot about students who have like studied abroad or they've interned abroad is there anything that you took away from your time or your residency in China that has helped your career or you as a businessman or anything related to that? For sure. So I don't, I don't think I would have ended up being an entrepreneur if I hadn't gone to China. Like when I went to China, my whole group of friends that I literally had to meet, like I literally got set up on like a blind date with another dude. And we like went and we watched like a soccer match and had some beers. And now he's like one of my best friends. and He was one of my groomsmen in my wedding. Um, but meeting all these people, they were all, they moved to China with like this similar sense of adventure and entrepreneurship. And so, uh, when I'd leave my job at EA, which was like more like nine to five, I'd go over to like one of their startups and one of my friends, he, he started the first, like one of the first social networks in China and his life and his job were kind of like all blended together. And I was like, this is so appealing. He gets to work with his friends. He's doing something new and crazy every day. And, and like that, it just seemed like, like so appealing to me as opposed to just working for somebody else. Had you not, obviously being in San Francisco, there was a ton of startup stuff happening too. I'm curious why it was actually going to China that brought that more into your world rather than maybe looking around other parts of San Francisco. I think San Francisco was definitely very different at the time. In like the late 2000s, it was kind of dominated still by um, kind of like the older companies, like the enterprise software companies. Like Facebook wasn't nearly as old. Like Google was just getting pretty pretty big at the time. Um, so yeah, it was it was slightly different, but it also is a little bit of the byproduct of where of what school you came from. Like Princeton had a lot of people that would went into consulting and investment banking and corporate jobs, and not as many going into startups. So it was actually yeah, it was going to China that really exposed me to like this whole new world of running your own company and being your own boss. And that was yeah, I. Never went back. <laughs> Perfect opportunity to transition into, I'm not sure if this was historically the next step for you, but I think one facet of your career that I've always been really curious about and sort of obsessed over is your own indie games company that you started. I would just love for you to give me a breakdown of the mindset because obviously you say that your your entrepreneur spirit, uh, entrepreneurship spirit was entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. That, yeah. Entrepreneurial spirit. I found the word, uh, was like kindled in China. And so is that what came next? Was the indie games company what came next? Yeah. So I left, I left China. I went back to business school and in my first two years, yep. Yep. yep two years in Philadelphia. And in my first year of business school, I think I had five internships. I worked for a financial firm in New York. I worked for a VC firm in San Francisco. I worked for a mobile indie game developer in Philadelphia, and Did I worked you go to for class at all. <laughs> uh, hopefully, Warden's not watching this. Uh, and uh, and I worked for a skateboard company in LA. And I was just like, I need to go see what is out there in the world before I make a decision. Like, what am I going to do with my career? <laughs> Dude, you are the fucking man. It's so dope. Uh, like, I, I I know how much I admire you already, but like when I hear all the things you actually did, is unbelievable. I well, can't like, believe you worked this. for a skateboard company. Uh, yeah, I like very briefly worked for the barracks, which is Steve Barra and Eric Costin. It's like their warehouse where they, it's, it, it was the precursor to actually Rob Deerdeck's fantasy factory. And I was just watching their videos all the time. And I was like, this is so interesting. And so I just like literally sent emails to all the guys that I knew that worked there. And I'm like, Hey, I'm in business school. Do you need some help? Like, I'm, I can do some, you know, like 
I can do some economics analysis for you or and something. And that was probably you know? how you got all of those opportunities, I would imagine. Was Literally just, out. just cold, cold emails to all of them what did and you, pitching. In hindsight, do you think there's, because people talk about this kind of idea a lot. I think a lot of people have started to recommend, oh, just find a way into people's inbox or into the door. Like, was there something in hindsight that you said or that you brought to the table that you think helped? Obviously, you were warden and you were an impressive guy and you've been at EA in, in, in China and stuff. But I'm curious if there was anything in terms of how you approached it or looking back that you said that made it like, hey, I'm going to respond to this guy. I'm going to give him the chance. I think in general, and this works for people who reach out to 100 Thieves as well. If you reach out with an idea for how you can help a business, it shows a lot of initiative and it shows that you understand that business. And instead of um, giving someone a lot of reasons to say no, it's like you almost remove the ability. Like if someone reaches out to me and is like, hey, I know 100 Thieves and here's something where I know that you guys don't do it and, and I'll do it for free and I have some competence. It's like, how can you say no to that? You know. And so taking a few minutes and really like, if you reach out to the companies and the products that you're like fascinated by um, and you offer your services, like it's really hard to, to turn that down. That is perfect advice because when people ask me on stream or they tweet me or they leave comments on YouTube, it's how do I come work for you? How do I inter internship for you? I don't have the best answer because just like them, it's very similar for me. I don't have a ton of that experience. And so to hear that directly from you, I think is incredibly valuable. And there's going to be so many people listening to that intently and thinking about, okay, how do I crack my way into esports or business or whatever vertical I want to work in? That is because that's one of the questions we asked Twiz on the it's just sort of like the hiring process. It's like interview tips and you just cold emailing tips. I love that. This is well, great. Like every every job that I've gotten in the last 10 years was me reaching out to someone and saying, I love your business. Here's how I can help. So that they're not, it's like the interview process can be so hard when someone's looking at five or six different qualified candidates and they're like, well, who's actually going to be really good at this job? If you can reach out and say, here's what I'm going to do for you, it makes You're it doing so the job easy. Before yeah. you get it. Exactly. It makes it so easy for somebody to say yes. Yeah. I think, I think it's like almost like make it easy for me to like figure out what you would do because people will reach out and say, here's my resume. Like, how can I help? And that's, a, it actually like takes work for me to think of, or for you to think of like the ways that they can help you. I think, I think that's amazing advice. So dive just a little, a little bit deeper into brother sport games. That yep. was your indie games company. Yep. What was the mindset? So I knew that I wanted to make games uh, after interning at the game company in Philadelphia. And so during my second year of business school, I basically stopped going to class and I made myself into a game designer and I'd never done it before. So I like went down to the UPenn engineering like quad and I basically said like, who are your top 10 graduates in the last five years that currently work at Zenga and EA? And I just started like relentlessly like hounding them like, my name's John Robinson <laughs> and I have this idea for a video game. Can you help me build it? And that was it. So like I literally spent my spring break of like that second year of business school when all my friends were going to like Cabo. Um, I flew to San Francisco to interview engineers and artists at EA and Zenga and Disney and other companies to try to convince them to come work for this random guy who had no money and no experience as a game developer. That is unreal. And what game did you make? So we made a game called Dunk Dreams. Uh, the, the idea was like, this was, uh, this was right as the app store was just getting going and EA was kind of taking all of their console games and porting them over to mobile. And I was like, why, why don't, why, why doesn't somebody make like a native mobile game? That's like really fun about basketball. And I've always been a huge fan. And this is, this is like right when, uh, Russell Westbrook was starting to like show up at like the press conferences wearing like Versace shirts and like, he would look ridiculous and basketball at that point was starting to become about as much about like the fashion and what was happening off the court as on the court. So I was like, why don't we make a game that's much more about basketball as a lifestyle as opposed to like being really good. At which is so obvious in hindsight now, which is, it was, that was when, 2012? Uh, yeah, there's like right around like 2011, 2012. That's awesome. So we made a basketball RPG and the basketball <laughs> RPG was like, <clears throat> in a traditional RPG, you know, you've got your sword and your helmet and whatever you're like, chain mail. And in this one, it was about your sneakers and your headband and your tank top and your shooting sleeve. Microtransactions. 100%. <laughs> so every week we would update the game with literally like whatever Russell Westbrook would wear at a press conference, we would add it into the game for the next week and sell it for like 9.99. 
<laughs> oh my god okay <laughs> people, you went to wharton people <laughs> people probably loved you right up until that point <laughs> yes but it was also like we um <clears throat> it was actually like a story driven game and so it was really fun to uh tell the story of like uh, the rpg was really you started as like a 16 year old scrub and you were living with your grandmother and you were going court to court neighborhood to neighborhood defeating opponents leveling up getting better gear um was there actually any like shooting mechanic? Did you actually play basketball? Yeah, there was. So there was like a little like skill mechanic basically. So it just like any traditional mobile RPG, there's like elements of character progression and leveling up your character and getting better gear. There's a little bit of like RNG and then there's like a skill-based element and those would combine into the like like how the game played out. I'm not even trying to gas you up because you're on the podcast and you're one of my really close friends, but holy shit, the game actually sounds really cool. Like it's not, I'm surprised it did it not gain any traction or at its peak dunk dreams was like a top 10 sports game in the U S on mobile. Um, but our, our retention was really good. Actually, unfortunately the game wasn't as deep as it should be. So like people would play through the whole thing pretty, pretty quickly. You were also um, like literally updating a weekly. You could, it's kind of like hard to balance the weekly updates, new clothes, everything with a depth of gameplay. Yeah. I would imagine. But I think my one, the one favorite thing that I took away from, from brother sport was like, I loved recruiting and I love being like the underdog and I had no business being a game developer and just going out and kind of like pitching your story and pitching your vision and trying to get people to come, come work with you was really, really fun. And at one point we were like, we were really trying to decide on like the, the art style for the game. And I was really inspired by like eighties cartoons, like the fat boys um, and LeBron at the time had a new Nike campaign called the LeBrons. And I love the art style of this cartoon. And I was like, how do we replicate this? And we kept interviewing artists trying to like get that art style. And finally I was just like, I'm going to go find the guy who was the art director on this. And I eventually tracked him down and he was based in Edmonton, Canada. And we convinced him to come be our lead no art way. director for the game. That is awesome. That's super dope. Okay. All right, so now that we have the background of John Robinson and, and really where you originated from, really quickly, we're going we're gonna to jump into a get more question from Rock and Mortgage. As you guys know, Rock and Mortgage is a premium sponsor for all things 100 Thieves. We've got the Rock and Mortgage team house for the LCS, and they've been like an integral partner for us in our success. So we have a get more question, and it comes to you, like I said, from our presenting sponsor, Rock and Mortgage. Uh, we've been working with them since the start of 100 Thieves, and they've been an amazing partner and helping give us more and better content. Our get more question is, what mindsets, qualities, or talents have you found to characterize top innovators, top innovators that you admire? So let me repeat that one more time. What mindsets, qualities, or talents have you found to characterize top innovators that you admire? For me, <clears throat> excuse oh, me. Oh, Jesus, Oof. going through puberty or what? I uh, hope not. <laughs> um, <laughs> Such for, an, I hope not. <laughs> for me, I would say uh, curiosity. Like, as I've the people that I've worked with that I've most admired, they're really, really good at the one thing that like maybe you see them do every day at work. But they're always like whether it's like their hobbies or the things that interest them on the side or the things that might interest them in the future. They're they're always they're always looking to like what's next, and it's never like oh, I kind of like this thing and they just dabble in it. They always go super, super deep. And so I, I love meeting people when I'm like, no, I, I know what you do professionally, but like on the weekends, like what do you really like nerd out on? Like, like what do you go deep on? Because I think this has been said on, on Twitter a few times before. It's like your hobbies on the weekends often turn into your career five years or 10 years down the road when they develop into real businesses. That's awesome. I, 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 Chris oh, Dixon, no, man. no. I'm definitely not going to be a professional gambler. I'm, de <laughs> I'm definitely not going to be a professional golfer. Maybe I could drink White Claws professionally, Dude, but you're holy You're a professional sh gamer. You're the case in point of this. Obviously not now, but like... Oh, back, yeah. Go back I, I'm, a just, little bit. I'm just saying I'm for the future. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> you literally, you just literally started out as a professional gamer who would buy a lot of clothes as a hobby, and now you're the CEO of a pretty large apparel company. Holy shit. Dude, you that are makes, the answer. Dude, that makes so much sense. Just don't wow. think about it going forward. Just don't think about my like my 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 long-term future. Unless I kind of like that, like, though. I mean, if you did end up a professional golfer in the next iteration of your career, like I wouldn't be that surprised if you put your mind to it and just decided, 
I'm passionate about this. I want to go be one of the best in the world and then and then go do that. Well, I promise you that's never going to happen. You could create your own anime. Dude, I'm not kidding. I have thought about that. I really believe that I Jayden could. Jaden Smith did it. If I took the time to really sit down and come up with a universe and a concept for like an anime, I would can crush it. You don't I know all need the, things that the I whole love. purpose of this. Like, if there's one thing I can leave you with, it's like you don't need a license to go do any of those things. Like, as he said, like Jaden and like Ezra from Vampire Weekend, one of my favorite bands, like they collaborated on that anime for Netflix. And like it was two dudes who had no background in anime and they just decided, like, hey, we're huge fans. We're gonna get we're gonna go be, we're gonna go create this. And I, I would actually argue that's probably representative of going back to your initial point, like what people are doing on the weekends, you don't need a license or permission to go start something or start working on something or create something. And I think that's where some of the coolest things come from. Like 100 Thieves, there was no one in 2014 that was like, yeah, Nate Shot should definitely go start his own team and organization and all this other stuff. It was just something that you, like your curiosity in terms of clothing, in terms of esports, in terms of something bigger than you naturally took you there. And eventually at some point you realized, hey, this might actually be something more than a hobby, but I think like that's such a cool way to look at it versus like, I'm going to go start a business on Saturday. I really appreciate you guys gassing me up here. And, and I actually, I want to thank Rock and Mortgage one more time for that fantastic question. And Great you question. nailed the answer. So thank you, Rock and Mortgage, uh, for sponsoring this episode and making this all possible, obviously. Rock and Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Push button, get mortgage. Push button, get more. Thanks, guys. Get more question. You knocked that out of the park, John. That was John. awesome. That was a All great right. question. So I think this is actually the perfect opportunity to, to bring us back to present day because we've we've talked a little well, bit so about how we met. Well, catch us up real quick. Oh, so let's go. Go ahead. Just I like to, this. Just, I think we had a gap in the timeline. Brother Sport for a couple years building your game, and then you went to Nexon for a while. Yep. Anything. Oh, yeah. We should talk about Nexon. I think it's obviously a huge company. You were there for, I think, three years, and I would imagine are like largely the executive and manager you are today. Do it a lot of that time. What's Nexon for anybody that didn't know or doesn't know? Sure. So Nexon's the largest game company in Korea. It's about a fifteen billion dollar company. I think it has over five thousand employees, and uh, I was responsible for their U.S. mobile group. So all the games that they would develop and publish outside outside of Korea. Um, so my group, we built it into about sixty people, kind of like development, marketing, publishing, distribution, community, things like that, um, and we put out six to 10 games a year. And yeah, that was, uh, that was, that was the job. Now the one, uh, the one fact of your time spent there that I always love because it really says a lot about like your skill sets is, uh, how large was the team that you managed at Nexon? I think about it, it started pretty small It started about 10 people and grew that to about 60 over the course of, of a couple of years. So you were managing over 60 people. Yep. That is unbelievable. I can barely manage my own life. And then, so th that was, I imagine, kind of the biggest group you had had in your career. And then you went super small. For sure. I mean, Brother Sport was six of us. Nexon was 60. So I like very quickly had to learn how to manage a large team. But it, it got a lot easier when I just tried to hire like the best people who were like head of product, head of marketing, like head of distribution, like head of community, you know, community support, like and then it just kind of, you know, like went from there. So, um, yeah, we built a we built a really good team and had a lot of success for a couple of years. But then I just got super, super interested in what was going on in esports. Ooh, that brings us to the beginning, really, of our relationship at 100 Thieves, because you were working at Bessemer, which is a uh, a, a VC, a venture fund, and uh, you were looking for opportunities to be a part of for a longer term, I would imagine. Yeah, so I got really interested and I saw what was going on. There were a couple of uh, VCs that had made investments in esports teams and that caught my attention. And so I jumped over to Bessemer and I said, like, let's go, let's go look at the esports scene. They had invested in Twitch, so they knew it really, really well. Um, I was really interested in going and doing something earlier stage again. So I said, let's go, let's go meet all these esports teams and see if there is an, an investment for you and a career opportunity for me. Love it. And you were at Bessemer for, I think, only like six months yeah. total? It was, a, it was a pretty straightforward project because I went in with a thesis. I, I basically pitched Bessemer and I said, let's go buy a team or let's go invest in a team and then I'll go you know, help run, the, help run that business. 
Um, and so from day one, we just started meeting with all the biggest esports teams in the world. What was it about? So you had pretty much exclusively made games or at least worked on the developer or publisher side in games your whole career. What about esports made it interesting to you and why leave the development side? Uh, I really enjoy the development side, but it also is like a real grind making games and developing games and putting them out. And especially when like the hit rate can be really, really low. And I also was just ready to start doing something different. It was a little bit of that like curiosity on the side. I found myself much more interested. Nexon had their own esports arena in downtown Seoul. And when I'd go over there, I found myself much more intrigued by what was going on with like the esports trends and seeing um, how well those players and teams and that business was doing relative to traditional game development. And then I, I just figured it was only kind of a matter of time before it was going to be just as big in the U.S. All right. So we start 100 Thieves. John Robinson joins December 2017. You and I start working together. Jackson joins the company. Fast forward two years later, and we have raised $35 million in our Series B. Wow, did I just skip over a lot of things? But you guys live that with us. So I don't think we need to jump too deep. Like, I want to look into the future because that's what excites me the most. And I feel like that's probably what other people want to hear us talk about because we put out a video that explained our, uh, our, our future plans for this $35 million injection into the company. We're obviously opening up a brand new training facility, which will be the center of all things 100 Thieves. We'll have our business staff in there, all of our teams, players, content creators, production studio, apparel workshop, retail space, which I'd love to touch on a little bit. Um, but we are expanding. In, in many, many different ways. Now, I would, I would ask, I know what I'm most excited about in like the next six months, but what would you say, and, and this question actually goes for the both of you, because really, this is like the founding team of 100 Thieves. And you guys have seen every iteration of this company. You guys have touched in, in, in every capacity, some part of, or every part of this business. So what, what is exciting for you guys in the next six months? We have the capital. We know we can stay in business for a long time. And we can really crack down on all the things that we're really excited about. What for you guys is, is really waking you up in the morning and saying, like, let's go and do this? Do you want to start? Uh, like apparel is so, so interesting to me. Like Same. it's, it is, it, it is what makes me most excited when you first described the vision of a hundred thieves and it, part of it being an apparel company, uh, was just like a dream come true. Like I've always liked the fashion industry. Um, and to have a chance to now build that out properly, you know, we've spent the last, you know, you and I worked on recruiting and hiring Doug for almost nine months. So like that, that whole experience learning about what the fashion industry, what the men's apparel industry looks like, finding a senior executive to come in and lead that for us. I think the, like the potential for that business is almost unlimited right now. And so I'm really, really excited to see Doug, the team that he builds and the creative vision that he has and how we can help, help bring that to life. You know what? I'm actually genuinely curious not to jump back into the past really quickly, but when you and I first had our conversations together about potentially working together. Did you ever imagine that 100 Thieves would be as successful as we've been? And I'm, I'm not trying to pat ourselves on the back, but we have built something pretty quickly that is, is, is very significant now in the world of esports. Did you believe anything that I was saying? Or like, did you believe in the Nade Shop brand? And I, I, guess, I guess this is for me personally. I'm just, what was going through your head when we first met? Because I've asked you and we joke around about it. But I'm, I'm genuinely curious what, what your thoughts were on this situation and what 100 Thieves could be. I, I honestly didn't know you that well. Like I hadn't watched many of your videos. I don't think Neither I'd seen... Neither did I. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'd seen any yeah, of them. Yeah, they're assholes. <laughs> I think like Blake Robbins was the first person to tell me like who you were. And uh, then I just like did a lot of research. But it was mostly like I saw... I mean, not to sound too much like a nerd, but I saw the statistics, you know? Like I saw how much success you were having on social and on YouTube. And I was like, wow, this is really compelling. Um, and obviously saw how well that first apparel drop did. And that was, I mean, it's, that's a foundation on like any other esports team, right? Okay. That's fair. All right. Jackson, he's excited about apparel. I'm excited about apparel and esports, but yeah. I'm curious what, 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 what is driving you? Well, I think, so for those of you guys who don't, I was actually going to tee it up really quickly. No, go, go ahead. ahead. I don't want... No, no I, I'm trying not to cut people off. Go, okay, go, go, okay. go, go. Well, for those of you who don't know, John effectively, along with Matt, obviously, leads our management team and our leadership team and does most of the recruiting. And I think the coolest part about the last few months is we've finally effectively rounded out our leadership team. 
So with Jacob and Doug, basically all of the core parts of 100 Thieves business are like in really good hands. And there was a while where John and I were doing partnerships and we were collectively were doing apparel and a lot of these parts, but to have somebody who's such an expert in each of those core fields, and now they just have a runway in front of them. The next year and a half is less about figuring out what we should do and more about how do we execute really well. Um, so I'm really excited for that on one end. And then on the other end, I think for the three of us, we also get to spend a little bit of time thinking about now that all of those core things are figured out, what else is there? And what could we be doing at 100 Thieves that weren't in like our initial, like when we set out a year and a half ago, it was content, apparel, esports, partnerships. And now we get to say, what is no one else in the industry doing? And what could we be doing? And I think that that is like far less certain, um, but is really exciting to me. And I spent a lot of time talking with John about. So that will be very much a TBD, but I think that extends well into the future and can change a lot. That's yeah. a vague answer, but I, no, I, no, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a vague answer. I think it, it makes a ton of sense. And I think that's actually one of the things that was exciting to me the most. I think you hit the nail on the head is that we now have all of the different verticals within our business accounted for. And one thing that I think that you do really well is you think through everything very thoughtfully and, and meticulously before we end up making decisions. And so much of your time has been occupied by like putting out fires with apparel and helping us, you know, deliver product to our, our, our customers and then building the League of Legends program and managing a lot of those parts. And now that you have a lot of your time freed up, I'm genuinely curious what's going to pop into your head next, because you are, you know, the director of business development at 100 Thieves, like that's your official title. And to hear that you, you actually are really excited, intrigued by business development at 100 Thieves and just... I'm I'm curious what we're going to cook up next. In the in the same way that I'm excited to see what comes out of Doug's head on like the creative side, like I I would agree with you. I'm very excited to see what Jackson comes up with. Next. No no pressure, man. No, no it's pressure. Gonna be, it's going to be really exciting. So so we talk about expanding on apparel, and then obviously with our Series B, we're going to have the ability to open up this new facility. And one of those key assets that I'm really stoked on is the retail space because this is the first time. Well, not the first time we had the pop-up shop at MLG Anaheim, which was on a, a, a not a small scale, but I think it could be much bigger in our own home. And so when we have this facility, we're obviously going to have the production studio. We're going to have streaming booths for content creators. We're going to have the practice rooms. We're going to have our own space to actually build out and conceptualize and design new pieces of apparel. I'm going to have my own studio. We're going to have the bullpen for all the staff to be working out of and really what we finally end up at is the last piece, which is the retail shop. And I just can't wait for fans to be able to come and actually interact in our home. And uh, I really just, I'm envisioning so much of that first drop that we do and what that line is going to look like on our sidewalk. And it, 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 it like gives me butterflies as, as I talk about it. Now, hopefully people still care enough about us and we are if they don't <laughs> what was that laugh wait on do that again no uh, we're gonna have to replay that uh and so i think the retail space maybe you could talk a little bit about that and sort of expand on the facility in general yeah i mean for the last 18 months in a lot of ways we've been a digital brand like we've been online people get to know about us they watch our videos they see us on social unless you're coming to the lcs or caught us at like one of our big tournaments in the last year you haven't really got to meet the people at 100 Thieves and meet our players and kind of like experience all the other stuff we're doing. And I think that's just like crucial to understanding and being a part of the community. So I think giving our fans that opportunity to come by, pick up a hoodie, meet you, hang out with Jackson and ask him about like internships. And I, I, I really do think it's like meaningful for people to come by and experience this in person, run into players, see the staff and, and just experience it live. We, Sorry to cut you off. I was just gonna say, we've been talking about the facility probably since like the very, very beginning about where we want to go. Do you remember, or either of you guys remember at what point we decided to involve the public in this space? Well, I, I will say that it is something that I have been apprehensive to. Now, I do want to man ex manage expectations because we haven't really gone into detail. The, the, the offices will not be open 24-7. You cannot just show up. And Please don't just show up. You Brand cannot just show up and walk in. It's not going to be that type of retail store. The store is not going to be open 24 seven, seven days a week. It will be for very specific occasions. We will have security. 
on hand. Okay. So, I mean, John talked about it. Like you can come interact with our players and staff and whatever the case may be. That will not be something that the doors are wide open for. But it Um, will be something on the other hand that we want to be able to create really special experiences for our fans from time to time. And it won't just be apparel either. I think the idea is to really bring people into our world in a way where they get to experience like the world of 100 Thieves in a physical, like tangible place. Absolutely. And I I guess for me, uh, selfishly, that was never really the mindset, but it's becoming more and more of a reality where we'll have the ability to do that. I think for me, the, the driving motivation has always just been the retail store. Just the idea of myself, because that's what 100 Thieves was always like the apparel strategy. I just wanted to create clothing that I thought was really cool. And for me to think that I can drive to work in the morning, walk into our brand new home and walk into this retail space and just see our clothes like hanging on these shelves and whatever the case may be, I just think that's awesome. So from a physicality standpoint where everyone gets to interact, I love to do that from time to time. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely like a, an introverted person to a certain degree. Um, but I, I am stoked on the fact that I'll be able to have meetups at this store and really, really bring this digital world to life in, in more ways than one. 100%. And now for me, transitioning next, it's like we talk about the retail space, but you know, with this $35 million, we obviously talk about the expansion into other games and titles. Yeah. Because right now we have League of Legends, Call of Duty, Fortnite, and aspirationally, of course, I've always wanted to be a part of other games. I think CSGO is top of mind for me just because we had a CSGO team at one point. And unfortunately, it was just a very messy situation with a lot of different variables that we could not foresee. And uh, we had to release that team. Um, but I, I, I think competitive gaming has always been the closest thing to my heart over the next 10 years or, or over the past 10 years. And now that we have the ability to actually go and secure other players that are prevalent in whatever title they play in that are super talented. I think that's next on the agenda. Now, I do, again, want to manage expectations. I don't want you guys to ever think that we're just going to jump into 10 more titles and have 14 different teams across 16 different games. It's never going to be the case. Like It's never going to be our strategy. And we're going to enter into each game that all of our company is really excited about. And we're going to do it thoughtfully. And we're going to do it at, at, at the right pace. Um, but I think for me, that's something I think about all day, every day. At the right pace, but we're here to win championships. Yeah, and and we, we touched on it again, too, in the uh, announcement video of the Series B, which if you guys haven't seen it, you guys should go watch it. A lot more information about the future of 100 Thieves in that video. It's a little bit more concise rather than this broader conversation. Uh, but we are committed to winning. Obviously, we didn't limp into Call of Duty. We went and got the best players right off the gate or right out of the gates. And we won two championships and hopefully a third and a fourth. And League of Legends, we talked about it. We are the second most spending team in the entire league. So we are committed to winning. Um, and that will be the same case for any other game that we we decide to participate in. And I think yeah. I, oh, go ahead, John. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the raise sets us up for the games that we're in today and for the games that we want to get into. And it sets us up, frankly, for the games that we don't even know about yet. Like we expect there to be just like with Fortnite last year or two years ago and the success of TFT recently, like there are going to be new competitive titles that come out. And for the ones that we really love and that our fans really love, like we want to be able to go in and have one of the best teams in the world. I think that's one of the coolest things about gaming and esports relative to sports is, yeah, it's great when you have these titles that have been around for a hundred years, but it's also really cool when you get to look forward to how everything's going to change. And we get to be nimble and agile as a company and say, what, what opportunities on the horizon are really exciting, which I think is sick. For sure. And then, and then just to round things out, I think the last piece that we should not ignore is obviously content. Like the production team that has been built at 100 Thieves, I think is second to none in the entire industry. And our production output is just unbelievable. I talked about it a little bit, but we went from uploading two to three to four videos a month. So now our best month, we had 20 videos uploaded. We have two podcasts. We have the Cash App Content House LA, which we're in right now. We're going to be collaborating more with Jack and Ray on Content House shows and, and, and videos. And, and the last piece I think that is going to be really, really, really compelling for me is we're going to bring on more entertainers and more content creators. And I think it's something that has always resonated with me with my time at Optic was that you, when we brought people together that all really love to do the same thing and had the same goals, like that is just an energy and, and chemistry that you can't recreate anywhere else. And it's something that I think we can really, I don't want to use the word manufacture, but we can, 
we can really create that mentality, which we are in, 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 a, in, in a small degree right now with me, Jack and Ray in this house, but bring out more entertainers that love 100 Thieves and love this world and they want to play in it more, I think is going to be a tremendous opportunity. And with this capital, we'll have the ability to go get those creators. I think YouTube is like a fascinating, fascinating place. Like I love just browsing and seeing all the interesting things going on right now, whether that's in gaming or out of gaming. And I think the opportunity is just unbounded given the the creators that we have and the talent that we have and the the creative staff that we have at 100 Thieves. Like I think it, I, I would totally expect our the content that we produce to be significantly better and bigger. And frankly, probably doing a lot of things that maybe we don't expect a, a year from now. Yeah, especially now that we'll have like an entire studio in the facility and we tools. won't be out of our living room. Yeah, more tools, more resources and, and, and more time and energy. So we've been working at this for almost two years. You talked a little bit about what you're immediately excited about. We talked about the facility, things like that. If you look a little bit further out, obviously, I think esports in general in this industry is pretty uncertain. What is either exciting to you or where do you hope to see 100 Thieves in two, three, four years? I hate that question. Uh, it's like my least favorite question when people ask me, like, where are you going to be in five years? Dog. I'm asking him. Okay, it's not for good. you. All right, perfect. It Got is it. a little bit of a dangerous question. My title is also COO, Chief Operating Officer. So um, for the longer term vision stuff, I think I think Matt is probably better. And, and I love thinking about that stuff and we spend a lot of time talking about it. But for now, it's like we are so laser focused on with the team that we have executing on the rest of 2019 and 2020. That's like such a huge task. And I think one of the best parts about esports is like we can kind of just let the market evolve and see what opportunities present themselves. I think we have some like really, really intelligent people who are going to see those trends emerge. And so my bet is that 100 Thieves has the right people and the right resources to spot those as they come up. And that's that's how we're kind of going to pivot as opposed to just saying we do one thing and that's it. And if the market moves, we're still stuck doing that thing. My bet is 100 Thieves, like any great business, is going to evolve significantly over the next five years. Strong I like answer. what There's that your guy new answer. said. That what that what that guy said right there. I just stamp it. That's it. I have one final question for you, John. Okay. Everyone, in terms of the company structure, everyone in Hundred Thieves, in some way or another, reports up into you, and then you report in up into Mister Nate Shot Hague right here. What is it like having Nate Shot as your boss, as the only person who can experience it? Uh, that is a great question. Um, you know, like he, he manages me pretty, pretty tightly. Yeah. Um, he has access to my calendar. We have our weekly one-on-ones. He makes sure that my priorities are like, you know, like on point. Um, but otherwise, uh, all joking aside, he's like, uh, he's everything that you want in a partner and a boss, right? It's like, he gives you the opportunity to succeed. He sets you up to succeed. He gives you a platform. He like, Basically, like all the resources and time that I need to help recruit great people and make all these things happen, like Matt's been supportive. So, do you agree? <laughs> do you concur? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what this guy's talking about. Uh, we're not going to get into all the hierarchy. I mean, I, I am everybody's boss. No, you're just his boss. No, I'm I'm your boss too. <laughs> no, don't get it twisted. Everybody in this room. I'm your fucking boss. All right, fair no, enough, I'm just fair kidding. enough. <laughs> uh, I'm sweating now. What happened? This was a great podcast. This was like tremendous. Like uh, you knocked it out of the park. I know you you were a little nervous. You you overanalyzed what you should be doing, what you should be talking about. This is gonna be three videos in three days for me. So I think I think the Hundred Thieves community is gonna be like, all right, we've we've seen enough of this bald guy. Dude, I always in the comments, I'm like it's like Nate Shot does this, this, and this, but the bald guy is behind the scenes doing everything. And I'm, I, I want the people to know. Not that he's doing everything, obviously, but. Yeah, me and John got a good thing. We're you like do. yin you and do. yang, man. He's good we at just, things. I'm good at things. We're giving transparency to the people, which I'm I think good. is what they last want. Year, last year when I did that first YouTube video, I like read some of the comments and it's like, hey, John, shave your head. It's thinning. <laughs> was and like, he listened to you, right? <laughs> like, Thanks, YouTube. You, YouTube comment peer pressure is real shit. It looks real good. Yeah, so man. I'm just saying. It, it looks is. Real good. Yeah. Like I can't actually picture you with hair anymore. And now when I'm you trying look back to the old videos, it's crazy. I'm, I'm trying to right now. And it's genuinely giving me anxiety. Like you, you're bald. Holy shit. You're bald. You're a bald man. Is this where we're going to end this? Do I don't think any... I don't think it's that I'm bald. It's that I shaved it. Yeah, nah, you're bald. No, he shaved it. It's okay. So okay. um, do you have out. anything else? No, I'm good. I think we covered everything. 100 Thieves, we covered everything. John Robinson, 
this was very informative. I think there was a lot of tidbits of a lot of gems of information that could help young kids or Seriously. college students or interns. I think we we did a lot. We accomplished our goal. We recorded self made, and uh, now you're going to take us out, Mr. Robinson. First off, if you're wondering hey, where the Robinson, Robinson comes from, Ian Let and Abel Robinson, me. Mud Dog Robinson, it's John. Where can people find you on the internet? You can find me on Twitter at Ron Jobinson. And can I give a couple shout outs? Please do. Uh, first off, just want to say thanks to Rocket Mortgage for sponsoring this. Mm. They've been a part of 100 Thieves since literally day one. Absolutely. Um, they've helped us do a lot of the coolest things that we've done, whether that was the Rocket Mortgage Team House or now these podcasts. So uh, big shout out to them. We're going to see them in Detroit coming up soon for the LCS finals. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, shout out Oak Boy, shout out Enable. <laughs> Let's go. All right. Everybody, thanks so much for listening today. You can find us again on YouTube, Spotify, Overcat, over. Uh, just kidding. That was wrong. Google Podcasts, a bunch of others. I, Overcast is what I was thinking of. Sorry. There's lots of podcast platforms. I'm digging a hole. Thank you for listening. And we will see you next time Wait. on Self Made. Wait, we got to say, shout, to say shout out vlog. Shout out Marco. We, we back on YouTube, baby. If you guys are watching this, hopefully you saw oh, the vlog Oh, leave a too. review, please. We, we enjoy your reviews and your comments and your feedback. So please, please do that too. Shout out vlog. Let's go. All right. We're vlogging again. Thanks, John. All right. Thanks, guys. YouTube, we'll see you fudging later. Come on.